So thank you. So I'm Tremel Hudson, and I'm going to be talking about Thunderstrike 2, which is a firmware vulnerability or a set of firmware vulnerabilities on MacBooks. You might have seen it in the press as you know the first firmware worm that affects Macs, that it's you know super stealthy and backdoors them, uh, that it remains after reformatting and it can be remotely installed, and that it's undetectable and it can't be removed. There's a lot of hyperbole in these sort of press reports, but it is true that firmware malware, once it's installed, is very hard to detect, very hard to remove. And that's because it installs in the SPI flash on the motherboard, also called the boot ROM. And on most systems, the SPI flash is really the root of trust. This is where all of uh, everything in uh, so the security of the boot process depends on the sanctity of uh, the boot flash. And because this uh, boot flash contains literally the first instruction the CPU executes when it starts up, it's possible to uh, circumvent any other software mechanism uh, that attempts to uh, uh, ensure security. So. One other really important part about this talk is that Thunderstrike 2 is not a new vulnerability. It's actually built on five previously disclosed multi-year-old uh, UEFI firmware vulnerabilities uh, that, uh, along with uh, collaborators uh, Corey Kallenberg and uh, Zinokova, we are able to port from commodity PCs to Mac systems. And that is the real key point of this talk is that UEFI firmware vulnerabilities are shared between these different systems because they share so much in common. You might think that your shiny MacBook has nothing in common with uh, some run-of-the-mill commodity desktop PC. Um, it has a different motherboard. It has a different OS. It runs, uh, you know, pretty much everything is different. but. Under the covers, they look very, very similar. That when you disassemble it, we see the same sort of code paths. We see the same functions being called. We see the same vulnerabilities appearing, even though they're built with different compilers, different optimization, and, and frequently uh, very different versions. There is still a lot of uh, commonality, and the commonality goes back to the earliest days of the PC. Uh, IBM's 16-bit real mode BIOS in the early 80s was cloned by Phoenix, and then everyone else reverse engineered and, and cloned that one. In 95, uh, Intel started the extensible firmware interface project to try to support new CPUs, bigger memory, uh, fancier hard drives and things. And uh, in the early 2000s, when Apple switched over to the uh, the Intel CPUs, they uh, forked Intel's EFI standard and uh, used that for their systems. A few years later, Intel uh, transferred all ownership of EFI to the unified EFI forum, and that's why it's called UEFI now. And the forum has continued development, uh, adding a lot of features, secure boot, and other things. And they continue development uh, on this. Um, we can see that on Christmas Day, there were commits being made to their code tree. And some of these are security related. Uh, you know, a suspicious null pointer dereference could be a security vulnerability. So even after uh, 10 years or so of divergence, there's still millions of lines of code shared between Apple's EFI and the more recent UEFI firmware. What most firmware vendors do is very similar to what Apple has done. They fork the open source tree at whatever version it is. They kind of freeze at that head. They port it to hardware platforms, and they sell these packaged firmwares. So when Intel fixes, or excuse me, when, when the, uh, the EFI forum fixes bugs in the EDK2 tree, uh, that doesn't mean that all the vendors have actually done a git pull and, uh, and, and patched. And even if they have fixed it on their new motherboards, they haven't necessarily fixed it on their decades of uh, legacy systems. And even if they've shipped a firmware update, there's no guarantee that uh, users install it. Most people don't install firmware. Uh, and th this is an area where Apple has actually really excelled. 
that they are actively pushing firmware updates for systems going back uh, almost 10 years uh, when firmware security vulnerabilities are disclosed to them. So that's enough of the history lesson. Uh, let's talk a little more about Thunderstrike 2. As I mentioned, it's built on five previously disclosed multi-year-old firmware vulnerabilities. Uh, these have been, uh, in, all the details have been published uh, going back 2014, 2013, some of them as late as, excuse me, as early as 2007. This first one, the Speed Racer, uh, was presented last year here at 31C3 by Corey Kallenberg. And it is a hardware race condition that allows uh, in a multi-threaded, or excuse me, in a multi-core uh, CPU, uh, allows a second core to get right access uh, to the BIOS. Uh, and the reason for this goes back to, again, you know, legacy hardware. Uh, the Intel uh, Interface Control Hub was designed for a single-threaded system. There is the BIOS write enable bit that prevents accidental writes uh, to the firmware, unless you're in ring zero. There's the BIOS lock enable bit that allows SMM to arbitrate writes, uh, the, to arbitrate uh, the BIOS write enable bit. When the, bit is when the write enable bit is set to one, an SMI is generated, SMM gets a chance to decide whether to allow it. And if it doesn't want to allow it, it sets the bit back to zero. But that leaves a race condition where the second thread uh, has BIOS write enabled enable, uh, turned on for a, a few cycles. And it can keep trying and trying to, uh, to write to it. Intel actually realized this was a problem in uh, 2004 when they migrated to the platform controller hub. And they added a third protection bit, the uh, SMM BIOS write protect disable in which uh, all threads have to be in uh, SMM in, in order to be able to write uh, to the firmware. So on a correctly configured system, uh, the uh, write access to the firmware is controlled um, first by the protected range registers, and then by the SMM BWP bit, and then by the BIOS lock enable bit. Uh, Corey and his collaborators uh, went through responsible disclosure and uh, uh, disclosed all the details to CERT, and uh, most of the uh, firmware vendors were affected because they had not updated uh, to use all of these hardware protection measures that, the, that Intel was providing. Uh, Apple specifically said, however, that they were not affected. So we wanted to find out if that uh, was actually the case. Going back to the data sheet, we can read uh, the BIOS control register, which is um, at offset DC in the, uh, in, in the hub. And we can use a tool like uh, Read Memory, which is a open source tool that lets you uh, read arbitrary physical memory on OS X. And what we find is that it has the value of eight. And that means that uh, neither the BIOS write protect bit nor the BIOS lock enable bit are set. Uh, this is, you know, is not the recommended configuration. And it turns out that a OS resident attacker uh, is able to write a, uh, a one to the BIOS write enable bit, and now they can write uh, to the BIOS. They can't write to the entire BIOS because of the protected range registers. But it does mean that they can write in, uh, arbitrarily into the NVRAM variables. They can also write to any region that's not protected by the protected range registers. And uh, if you corrupt the, uh, that portion of the, of, the, of the firmware, it actually bricks the machine so that it is unable to boot. Uh, we went through, again, disclosure with Apple. And they rolled out a fix. And it goes all the way back to 10.6.8 which was released in uh, 2008. So that's almost eight years of uh, systems that are, that are now protected. And because Apple does the automatic rollout, they, uh, th these systems, uh, for the most part, have been updated and are now protected. Uh, one problem is that the fix was, was just by changing the protected range register, which means that the SMM BIOS write protect is still not set and the BIOS write enable bit is still vulnerable to an OS resident attacker. 
So only the protected range registers are preventing writes. Which brings us to our second vulnerability, the Darth Phenomis or Dark Jedi Coma attack, also presented uh, publicly for the first time uh, last year at uh, CCC um, by uh, Rafal and uh, some collaborators. What they realized is that when the system goes into a S3 suspend to RAM sleep, uh, all of the flash protection bits get unlocked. And when the system comes out of sleep, there's a brief uh, race window that allows an attacker to have write access to the firmware. A as always, they went through responsible disclosure. And it turns out that Apple had, was not contacted by CERT uh, regarding this, but they were informed through uh, USRT. To understand how to uh, take advantage of this vulnerability, we, we have to go back to the, uh, the boot script specification which uh, describes how the system, uh, how EFI goes through a normal boot and then when it resumes. During a normal boot, uh, the system probes for connected devices, looks to see what's out there, and it writes a uh, sort of a cheat sheet of memory addresses and uh, configuration registers into this, this boot script. And then on a resume, it just runs through the script right into those same addresses. Not everything can be expressed in just a simple write, so there's a dispatch opcode that gives you the ability to put in a function pointer. So again, we can use the, uh, the read memory tool to read out the boot script, which uh, is actually the pointer to it is stored in a uh, NVRAM variable. And when we parse it, we see a bunch of those memory writes. And this write down here is the one that writes into the protected range registers and uh, the flock down bit to, uh, to lock them. But that occurs too late in the boot script. We've already had a dispatch uh, to a function. And because the boot script lives in unprotected memory, we can uh, use the write mem tool to poke our own uh, function pointer in there. And then when the system goes into sleep, um, which is a user, um, uh, a user command, the system wakes back up and those protected range registers are no longer protected, which allows the OS resident attacker to write uh, pretty much anywhere in the firmware uh, for, for the, uh, the CPU, which again allows it to take control of the machine from that first instruction and circumvent uh, any other uh, chain of trust. We again, went through responsible disclosure with Apple, um, and they, uh, in their notes, said that a insufficient locking issue existed, and it was addressed through improved locking. So, very uh, uh, brief uh, commit log there. There's an additional uh, sleep vulnerability that we didn't see, but was also fixed in that patch. Uh, OSX Reverser uh, also watched the uh, CCC talk last year and w experimented on recreating it on his MacBook. What he found was actually much worse, that the, uh, the S3 implementation left the flash protection completely unlocked after a suspend resume cycle. Um, as you might imagine, that's a bad thing. Uh, and it turns out this is a rediscovery of a 2013 vulnerability called Snorlax, uh, in which uh, Dell systems failed to properly set write protection after resuming from sleep. Um, and that was a team at MITRE uh, that, that found that. The reason that, uh, that we didn't see it uh, in our tests is that our slightly newer MacBooks had a different Intel chipset. And at some point, there had been a silent fix that uh, the either Intel rolled out a uh, improved reference implementation for that hardware, or Apple fixed it, but it meant that new machines were not vulnerable to this, uh, this issue, but older machines were, and no one publicly knew uh, which were which. There's a similar silent fix that happened with the, uh, the, the brand new MacBooks, the ones with uh, the USB-C uh, uh, only, that it appears to be using um, something like SMM lockbox, so they're not vulnerable to, um, uh, to, to the boot script hijacking. 
So as I mentioned, uh, Apple addressed the, uh, both the uh, Darth Venomous and the uh, Snorlax or Prince Harmon vulnerabilities through improved locking. What they did is moved the, uh, the code that sets the, uh, the lock bits and the protected range registers to before the S3 script is executed. But the S3 script is still in unprotected memory and available for an OS resident attacker to hijack. They can't use it to, um, uh, to, to directly turn off the flash protection, but there are other inter interesting things that this lets you do prior to the OS kernel starting up, um, possibly get into SMM. I'm, I'm still looking into that. So one, you know, with, uh, with the easy routes to getting the flash unlocked uh, sort of taken care of, there's one time when the flash is deliberately unlocked, and that's during a firmware update. So Corey Kallenberg uh, found a class of integer overflow bugs that he was able to write a scanner for that uh, searched through uh, lots of different firmwares. And he found a, uh, that a lot of these vulnerabilities occurred uh, when the flash was in an entirely unlocked state, um, meaning during a firmware update. One of the machines that he showed this on was a uh, HP laptop, and uh, what's happening is that the, um, the length there in the descriptor buffer is user controlled. Uh, so it's possible to generate an integer overflow in that length, which then gives him code execution uh, while it is parsing a firmware update. So this is, this is being run with the flash unlocked and uh, gives him full write access. This affected so many systems that uh, he won the Pony Award for best privilege e escalation at uh, Black Hat earlier this year. Uh, as always, uh, responsible disclosure is really important. Um, and as you see, almost everyone's affected, uh, except Apple. Uh, Apple uh, claimed that because they don't use the standard uh, UEFI firmware update routine, they're not vulnerable to this, uh, to this attack uh, because they have their own firmware update routine. If you're interested in that, uh, the Thunderstrike 1 talk that I gave last year at CCC goes into extensive detail about how, how Apple does their firmware updates. The problem comes that everything in, in UEFI is done via function pointers and these 128-bit GUIDs. So when you want to call a function, you pass in this GUID and it looks it up in a table and then returns a function pointer to you, which means that the linker can't uh, remove a lot of uh, dead code because there's a reference to it in this, uh, in this dispatch table. So the, uh, the vulnerable uh, firmware capsule update routine uh, turns out is present in Apple's ROM. So even though Apple doesn't use this for, for their firmware updates, the code is still there. And uh, through what, uh, what Corey and Zeno called BIOS necromancy, they were able to generate a set of inputs that caused that code to get executed. So you know, again, two very different laptops, uh, but they share very similar uh, code in that, uh, in that vulnerable routine. Um, obviously, they've been built with different compilers and different optimization levels, but you can see that the uh, that integer overflow is still there. As a result of uh, uh, our work in proving that and disclosing it to Apple, they have updated their status uh, with CERT, and now a year after it was publicly announced, they've uh, they've um, admitted that they are affected, and they have rolled out a, uh, a fix. Um, the, the particular vulnerability is actually kind of a, a very neat uh, one to, to, to look into, that you know, unused functions um, can contain these vulnerabilities. Legacy functions can contain these vulnerabilities. And it becomes really important that when uh, code is being audited, that both the new code and this legacy code uh, get, gets reviewed and gets updated. So going back to another legacy feature, one uh, that goes back again to the 1980s with the original IBM PC, the BIOS at that time would look on 
uh, the motherboard to these expansion ROM sockets to see if any optional features were installed. Things like the basic interpreter, a hard drive controller. It would also look on the expansion bus to see if any cards were installed, uh, like a video card so that it's able to um, uh, display the, the boot messages as the, as the BIOS uh, starts up. Unfortunately, this code is run in the BIOS in ring zero before the kernel, and that's really a bad idea for security. Uh, John Heisman in 2007 showed how this could be used to get uh, persistence on, um, uh, on servers with certain uh, network cards. Snare in 2012 showed how uh, Thunderbolt is actually PCIe and it loads option ROMs off PCIe. My talk at uh, last year at CCC showed how you could use an option ROM to, uh, uh, during a firmware update to get uh, code execution with the unlocked uh, uh, ROM. And then uh, earlier this year, uh, Zeno and I presented um, a class of vulnerabilities at uh, DEF CON um, r related to uh, all of these uh, five that have been fixed. Um, following CCC, the disclosure at CCC, uh, Apple rolled out a fix that uh, partially addressed the Thunderstrike 1 issue. What they changed is that the system no longer loads option ROMs during firmware updates, which uh, prevents Thunderstrike from getting code execution um, during, uh, during a firmware update, but it still gives you a way to get persistence and, and code running on the system. There was a follow-on update um, a little bit later due to uh, a uh, rollback vulnerability. Um, and even with this patch applied, as I mentioned, you get code execution during the boot so if you have a Thunderbolt adapter, these um, uh, Thunderbolt Ethernet adapters are uh, super popular for this sort of research. Uh, it runs uh, before the kernel starts, and it's able to log keystrokes, uh, such as the firmware and uh, file vault password there. Um, it also gives you a way to get persistence. So if you get a remote shell on a system, uh, you can map all of uh, physical memory, look for PCIe devices, uh, write your code into the option ROM on it, and the next time the system boots, that code's going to run. This is almost as good persistence as the SPI flash. Uh, it doesn't necessarily give you um, uh, the ability to circumvent all of the root of trust because option ROMs are loaded uh, much later in, in the boot process, but it still is a very dangerous thing to, to let happen. Uh, earlier today, uh, uh, Johanna uh, Vitalska presented um, something showing how much writable state there is in the system. And it's really scary how many things have writable firmware blobs. Um, you know, your fancy Thunderbolt monitor has an option ROM in it. Your uh, SSD might have an option ROM in it. Uh, so Intel realized this was a huge problem. And uh, for the secure boot process, they require that option ROMs be signed. Unfortunately, Apple has not uh, updated to a version of UEFI that supports secure boot. So this is not an option on, on Apple systems. Um, it's also not uh, an option if your system doesn't support secure boot. And if someone gets the ability to write to the firmware flash on the motherboard, secure boot won't do anything for you. So. But the key point is, these are all cross-platform uh, vulnerabilities that were found on commodity PCs, and we were able to port over uh, uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to the Mac platform. You know, most of them um, are patched at this point by Apple. Um, uh, I've heard that the new iMacs and uh, some of the newer systems are no longer loading option ROMs, which I think is great and uh, USB-C doesn't have option ROMs yet, but maybe Thunderbolt 3 will bring option ROMs to USB-C, we'll see. So, uh, you know, all these vulnerabilities are, uh, they're, they're interesting, I'm glad we've got them fixed, but it was really fun to package them together into a proof of concept uh, demo. So let's, uh, let's see how could this all come together. So unlike last year, uh, it, it actually can start with a, um, 
uh, just a, like a software exploit, maybe a software download or a Adobe Flash um, uh, sandbox escape or something that then can escalate to root with whatever the uh, root exploit of the day is. And once it has root, it can uh, install a kernel module to let it uh, go walk through physical memory. If the system is subject to uh, Prince Harmon, it's able to immediately write malware into the motherboard boot flash. It can also then uh, search the PCIe uh, uh, space for devices with option ROMs and write itself into them. And in this case, the, you know, it, it found a uh, Thunderbolt Ethernet adapter, so I go ahead and flag that that one's infected. Um, and now, the next time the system reboots, the uh, Thunderstrike 2 proof of concept is going to be run from the motherboard boot flash. It's not trying to be stealthy or anything like that, so it displays a big splash screen and, and logo. Um, and because this runs before the OS X kernel has started, it can do pretty much arbitrary things. It can get into SMM, it can hide in virtualization. It has you know, total control of the system at this point. Um, if you uh, reinstall OS X, it's still there. You swap out the hard drive, it's still there. Because uh, it's, you know, it's literally in, in the motherboard. So, uh, you know, if we put the infected system aside and, but we, and plug that infected adapter into a clean system, when this one boots, uh, it loads the option ROM off the, uh, off the Thunderbolt adapter. Uh, this is a newer laptop that is not subject to uh, Prince Harmon, so it can't directly write to the flash, but it can use uh, Darth Venomous to hook the S3 boot script, and uh, I don't know if you can see it also reports my uh, firmware password on there. And then the system uh, continues to boot normally. <coughs> uh, when the system goes into an S3 sleep, such as when the lid is closed, uh, th the CPUs are going to shut down. And you don't have to open the machine. I've just done that to show that the, uh, the fans have turned off, the CPUs are completely powered down. When the uh, system uh, wakes back up, the, uh, the S3 script is executed prior to the boot flash being locked, so it's able to write itself into uh, the boot flash on the motherboard. And again, I just flag it so I know which ones I've infected for uh, cleanup afterwards. So from the perspective of the, uh, the user of the system, um, it took just a couple extra seconds for it to uh, come out of that sleep mode, um, but you know, nothing out, out of the ordinary. So th and then the next time this system reboots, it's going to uh, also display the, uh, the boot screen um, uh, logo. So we've now possibly uh, you know, infected uh, another machine uh, via this sort of viral transmission. Um, and what's interesting is, this didn't touch the, the OS at all. This was completely um, at a level below uh, the operating system. One of the other things that Thunderstrike uh, 2 proof of concept does is it watches for the PCIe hot plug event. So when a, when a clean adapter is plugged in, it detects that and uh, the interrupt handler writes the option ROM uh, to the device. So this allows it to potentially spread and potentially cross uh, air gap security measures. And um, so if you have a uh, uranium centrifuge plant that you're trying to get into, this might be uh, one of those ways to do it. So the, uh, the, the proof of concept is, is showing a, a really neat sort of life cycle for this kind of malware going from you know, a software exploit that's able to escalate into the boot flash or the option ROM hook S3, get into SMM, and then go on and infect other machines in the boot flash. And once it's in that sort of boot flash option ROM uh, kind of space, it's completely uh, underneath the OS. So most vi virus scanners uh, aren't even looking for it and probably couldn't even see it because they have the ability to uh, trap all of those memory references and hide from, uh, uh, from normal scanning techniques. Um, Pretty much the only way you could see if it's in the boot flash would be to uh, put a chip clip on the, uh, on, the, um, on the SPI flash there and read it out and hope that uh, nothing's interfering with that. 
um, you know, any attempt to do it in software is going to be masked by the, uh, by the, um, the proof of concept. So, uh, Johanna presented a lot of ideas about things we could do to um, uh, deal with the inevitability of rootkits and firmware issues, um, you know, attempts to try to uh, move it outside the system. But there are a lot of uh, smaller steps we can take as well. Um, things like checking the signatures on the option ROMs or not even loading option ROMs is a, is a really big first step. Uh, using all of the locks that the platform provides, um, you know, is, is really key. Uh, making sure that the BIOS is not writable uh, to OS resident attackers. Making sure that uh, they can't hook the S3 boot script to get into SMM. Um, you know, Intel has added features to UEFI, like the SMM lockbox, that allow the S3 boot script to be protected uh, from attackers. And there are tools like Chipsec and uh, Copernicus that uh, can help validate these configurations uh, to make sure that the systems are being uh, booted and run in a uh, safe manner. Uh, Intel is also continuing uh, some hardware attempts. Uh, some of their newer CPUs have a fun feature called Boot Guard. And this adds actual uh, ROM for the first instructions the CPU executes, uh, which uh, is sufficient to do a cryptographic verification of the boot flash before executing any code out of it. This is great for security, but unfortunately, this locks out free software developers. So uh, systems with boot guard are, not, are fundamentally incompatible with, um, uh, with core boot. And th there's, th that's a really difficult uh, move for, uh, for, for software freedom, even if it does provide a, a good level of protection. And my, my plea to uh, system vendors is uh, that when uh, new vulnerabilities are disclosed, that you know, to really work with researchers to try to figure out if they're vulnerable. Um, I write a lot of proof of concepts, and they're really difficult to get working on one machine, much less a, a range of machines. So sometimes vendors take the proof of concept, they run it on their system, it doesn't work, and they say, oh, we're not vulnerable. And there's really not any uh, um, uh, risk to them for doing that. So, you know, it, it would be great if vendors were, were more proactive in working with researchers on, on helping to port these things and, and find that out. Um, the legacy code, you know, as Corey found, there's a lot of code, dead code in EFI that may have uh, vulnerabilities. And even if you think that your system's not running it, it might be possible with a set of inputs to, uh, to f get the code to jump into it. Um, it's super important to test the full cross-product uh, cross of old vulnerabilities and uh, systems, that things like Snorlax being an old vulnerability that reappeared a few years later is actually really kind of scary. You know, that there was, we, we learned about a really serious bug and uh, systems got fixed and then new systems got produced that were still vulnerable to that old, uh, to that old bug. That, that's a problem. Likewise, new vulnerabilities uh, might, a lot of times they don't necessarily get tested against uh, older systems, so we don't know what uh, machines are actually vulnerable other than the current generation of, uh, of machines. And you know, please, if you're in an opportunity to, uh, to fix security vulnerabilities, don't just do it silently. Make sure that people know you know, these are the uh, CVEs that are being patched against. These are the, the things that, uh, that are being changed and what, um, what systems will actually be secure against. Because when we're in the dark with this, it's really dangerous. We don't know if we're going to, uh, uh, you know, just because my machine's two years old and you've got a, a newer machine, it's dangerous for, for, um, uh, for us to not have that certainty. So, uh, on that, I'd uh, love to uh, open up for some questions. Uh, there's a lot more uh, details about the vulnerabilities uh, on my website. I'm also uh, happy to take uh, GPG uh, emails and uh, you know, continue the discussion on, on these uh, firmware topics.
Thank I you. think you switch it off for the key. I think the battery is dead. <laughs> to be quite honest. Okay, we'll do this without the mic for a second. Now we're gonna take. Can you try that one? Yes, we should be on tape. Thank you. <clears throat> Not for you guys, but for the people out there in the stream. So we're gonna do a little question talk. And we'll do one question from the room, and one question from the web, and then again a question from the room. So are there any questions out there? Yep. Mike three, please. Uh, yes. Um, have you seen actual uh, uh, SPI flash arrays uh, commands going to your flash chips, or how, how is it actually managed on the background uh, with uh, different SPI uh, flash chips? Are, are you asking, uh, does the OS periodically do erases of some sort? Uh, well, how the, uh, because to, to write to flash, you also have to erase flash first before you can write to it, right? That, that's right. So yeah. for things like the, the NVRAM variables, um, and this, uh, th there's a related question of why does Apple leave uh, the, the flash writable? And they store NV the non-volatile uh, variables in, in the flash. Uh, so things like what is your screen brightness, what was the last Wi-Fi network and credentials that you logged into um, are stored in the, uh, in the NVRAM. And uh, it's stored in a um, in a log, uh, a pin structure. So you can add items to it, and then uh, they can set individual bits to mark, uh, uh, to tombstone old values. And once they fill up a block, then they, uh, they, they will do a full erase rewrite cycle. But typically, they, they just do um, uh, a pin and then a tombstone marking. Okay. Um, do we have a question from the internet? Is there anybody out there? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, uh, how is BootGuard uh, related or different uh, to the Trusted Platform module? So the Trusted Platform module is unfortunately not, uh, it assumes that the SPI flash is protected, that uh, the Trusted Platform module is outside the CPU, so, uh, and it only uh, signs, or it only generates hashes based on what the CPU has asked it to do. So if you have malware uh, that has taken over the SPI flash, it is able to uh, send whatever values it wants to the TPM. That the TPM can't look at memory, the TPM can't look at the state of the CPU, the TPM only hashes what's given to it. Um, so BootGuard moves the trust inside the CPU, so it's no longer having to go to this outside device um, and because BootGuard doesn't even uh, start executing code from the flash until it verifies it, this means that uh, a malicious attempt to modify the flash will be detected, or will be um, uh, detected on the next boot, uh, you know, for, for, for sure. Um, I, I don't remember if they have the sort of soft fail versus hard fail in, in the uh, BootGuard implementation, um, but yeah, th uh, the, the TPM, unfortunately, was a, uh, an interesting idea, but there's probably a dozen or two dozen papers on how to defeat it and get around it in different ways. Okay, the next question from Mike Three. Hi. Um, I have had my own share with reporting bugs to Apple and getting some feedback and making sure that they actually fixed it the way that I thought it should be fixed. Or, but I see that you seem to have that in a repetitive pattern that they thought they fixed it, they didn't consult with you, and they released the fix, and then you found out, oh no, it didn't work. Is that kind of, I mean, uh, is, I would expect that this is such a sensitive area where, what, where Apple would really want to have a dialogue with you. Did that never happen, or was it miscommunication? It's happened. On some of the bugs, they, there has been a good dialogue, and we've had, uh, they have sent me betas to test, and we've had back and forth. Um, occasionally, things uh, have been put out before we've had a chance to do that, um, and sometimes, 
uh, yeah, sometimes the dialogue takes takes longer than they want to, um, uh, to to wait for the fix. Although I do have really good hopes, um, uh, they've just uh, acquired uh, Zeno and Corey's uh, company, Legba Core. Uh, so I'm really hoping that this means that uh, Apple's firmware security is going to go even better than, than it's been in the past uh, few years. One more question from the net. Uh, nope. Do, uh, do you have a tool to check the current state of the, uh, of the MacBook, like is, uh, if it's vulnerable or not? The diff the difficulty with ascertaining if the system is currently vulnerable or currently infected is that a, um, uh, a, su a sufficiently stealthy malware can trap all attempts to read the ROM and read the state of things. So if it's been able to infect the system, it's very, very difficult uh, to even tell if that's happened. Um, tools like Chipsec uh, will attempt to tell you if the system is in a vulnerable state. And uh, that's one way to say if you, with a clean system, you know, you can check to see if it's, uh, uh, it, it, whether or not it looks like it's good. But if you've had a system that you think has been infected, uh, it, it's very difficult to, to say. Okay, is there one more question from the net? Uh, otherwise we're gonna call this a baby. Uh, okay, yeah, there's one more question from the net. Um, uh, what platform uh, would you uh, would you recommend to avoid uh, UEFI, uh, uh, UEFI, uh, EFI boot systems and which are nearly as compatible to our normal computers? Well, uh, UEFI is making its way into the ARM world now, so I'm not sure if it's possible to avoid uh, UEFI in its entirety. The you know by itself it that's somewhat of a good thing. It is extensible, it is nice to have uh, a lot of the, that functionality, but it is a huge amount of code in the trusted compute uh, base. And, you know, as most security researchers will tell you, that that is uh, problematic. Um, but at this point, it looks like all the hardware is going to be uh, UEFI in the uh, foreseeable future. Um, I do have good hopes for things like uh, Bunny's laptop, um, open source hardware laptop with entirely uh, open source firmware um, because that at least means that we're not running a bunch of uh, proprietary binary blobs. Things like the Intel management engine are you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, it's, we, we just don't know anything about what's going on inside of it and what it might be doing. So even if you have secure firmware, you've got a binary blob running that might be doing something that you don't want and that's a somewhat of a, a difficult situation to be in. Okay, let's have a final hand for Tramel. Uh, 